Welcome everyone to our fireside chat tonight. We are here with uh, John, Dilu, and Alejandra from uh, UFC Corcovado in Costa Rica. And uh, yeah, I know that John, as usual, has a message for us all. Perhaps we'll play some music. So go ahead, John. Well, I don't think I'm going to play any music today. It would be nice. I, I, I'm enjoying playing guitar and piano here. Maybe we could ask everyone who's not speaking to mute. And um, we could, if when, when you're gone. Oh, my goodness. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Somebody muted me. My goodness. Don't I didn't mute. Me stay, <laughs> don't, don't mute me, but <laughs> mute the other people, perhaps. <laughs> um, so it's really good to be here, and it's always good to see that the movement is growing around the world. I'm still hearing a child. Who, who has a child with us? Anyway, um, Hello, Ed from Kent. So um, there's many things on my mind, actually, and I think it's probably true for everyone. I mean, I've said it before. But... Huh? Okay, we have some Spanish speakers. Could we ask in Spanish to have a mute? Okay, so, so um, you know, it's, it's really a, a kind of um, hard time for a lot of people right now in the world. There's quite a lot of anger and, and violence going on, and winter in the northern hemisphere is coming, so there's also the changes in the weather. So the people who are homeless or the people who are hungry or the people who are fleeing from, from violence in different places are having a really hard time. And I notice that a lot of people kind of get into a mood where they're angry and they're, and they're um, we were, I was just in London. I spoke at a, at an event in London and um, there was this enormous demonstration. And people were very, very upset. And huge numbers of people came out. But I'm not really sure exactly what that does. You know, if, you, if, you, if we all get angry and we march around, I, I'm not sure it actually changes too many things. But... If we work in ecosystem restoration communities, it can change the soil. It can change the water quality. It can increase the amount of water. It can hold the moisture close to the earth and alter the temperatures on the surface of the earth and, and go back into a natural cycle where the soils are replenished with nutrients and with microbial and fungal communities which are the basis of making the mineral nutrients bioavailable to plants and ultimately animals, including ourselves. So what I like to think about is that in making this movement and working with everyone in this, in this movement, we actually can do something that is, is useful immediately to restore damaged ecosystems. Um, we were just talking with our colleague in Iran about the desertification in many places. And that's how I started in this, in this idea of studying and documenting and learning about, about ecology was looking at desert systems. And the systems I was looking at were unnatural deserts. So they had not been deserts. They had been beautiful places. 
and they were transformed into terrible deserts. So what I learned then, and that was about 30 years ago, was it's possible to rehabilitate large-scale damaged ecosystems. And from that time on, I've considered restoring large-scale damaged ecosystems to be more important than anything else that we could do. And I've also come to understand that as an individual or as individuals, we can't do what needs to be done. We can only do it if we all work together. And what I'm really excited about with the ecosystem restoration, first camps and then communities, is that what can happen is that more and more people join this movement. And when everybody joins this movement, then we're going to have a different, a different outcome. And right now, when we look at the society and we see all these things which, are, which make us angry, we're pretty worried about the violence and the number of people who are not being served by the society and the civilization that we have now. And we can look back at that and, and understand what happened historically. But really what we need to think about is, what's the future going to be? Are we learning from what happened in the past? Or are we, if we, because if we don't learn the lessons from the past, we're destined to repeat them. And now we're seeing things that look like World War I and World War II. And so for a very long time, like 100 years, we're, we're reliving again the things that, that the society should have already learned. And now we also have even more dangerous weapons. And the, the, the impacts, when I, when I look at many of the landscapes, I mean, ancient Persia comes to mind even, that the concept of destroying the landscape to defeat your enemies is the basis of some of the destruction in those regions and maybe all of the destruction in those regions because it creates feedback loops, which then alter the hydrological cycle, alter the soil fertility, alter the biodiversity, and ultimately it collapses the ecosystem. And then what we see is the civilizations that are in these areas where the, the ecosystems have collapsed, they're terribly challenged. And so I think we're now at a place where it's been called the Anthropocene now. And we, we look at evolutionary impacts or we look at geologic impacts or cosmic impacts on, on Earth systems. And now we're talking about that human impacts on climate, on biodiversity, on soil fertility, on hydrology are equal to cosmic or geologic forces. That's extraordinary. We, we have a negative impact if we're thinking of it this way. But what I've seen and what, what I think more and more people are learning is if you can destroy ecosystems, you can restore ecosystems. And if we all restore ecosystems, the inf if, we, if we see that you can restore them, the inference is we could restore all degraded lands on the earth. So if we can, why aren't we doing that? And I would say that the reason we aren't doing that is really because we've been valuing other things. We've been valuing materialism. How do we get a bigger house or more cars or more airplanes or whatever it is that we want, more computers or whatever, whatever thing. But now go and look at the dump and realize that everything that we're making is ultimately ending up in this trash heap and we can't even, con we can't control it. It's out of control. There's too much. I mean, imagine the archaeologists a thousand years from now are going to be digging around. And when they get to this, you know, like if you, if you do, if you're studying archaeology or, or, 
many different subjects from paleontology to a number of things. You, you make core samples. And when you make a core sample, then you bring it up and you look at the core, you can actually see through sediment layers and put the time on what, what, what you're finding. When a thousand years from now they put these cores into the ground, they're going to find the toxic layer. And they're going to say, what, what, what was the civilization thinking at that time? Because there's all these persistent organic pollutants that are, you know, carcinogenic or, you know, never, never disappear, not biodegradable. Why would they create and then live in a place that is so unhealthy? And so here we are. Six years ago, there was a, seven years ago, there was an article written called Earth Restoration Peace Camps. I'll, I'll put the, the, the link in here later if you haven't already seen it. Share it with everybody. And then after that, thousands of people started to say, well, let's make ecosystem restoration camps. And now we, we had to create a foundation to do that. And so that was six years ago. And six years ago, there were zero camps. And the first camp was built in Spain. And now they're 65. So when I consider this kind of development trajectory, there could be 60,000 in five years or 10 years if we're serious about this. Because it looks like everywhere in the world, people are willing to restore their earth system because it's immediately impactful on their soil fertility, on their hydrology, on their productivity of their agriculture, of their biodiversity, and of their peace and well-being. So I think we all should not think about protesting too much. And I think we should protest or, or, or name what's wrong, but we shouldn't spend a whole lot of time on that. We should spend quite a lot of time on bringing people together in peaceful communities to restore ecological function in a way which will help everyone. And that can ensure that the children and the next generations to come have the safety and the peace that they need. And, and ideally, those people who are being violent look around and they say, well, maybe it's not a good idea to have this kind of thing. We've learned more. We're older as a civilization. We're older as a species. And we have consciousness. What are we doing with this consciousness? What are we doing to determine our intentions individually and collectively? So individually, if we say, well, I, I think I'd prefer to work on the soil and the water and the vegetation and the biodiversity and the wildlife and having everybody live together in harmony, that's better <laughs> than saying, well, I think I'll work to get as much money as I can and take care of myself and, and not worry about anybody else. We can do this if we all have the same intention and we all work together for the good of all. So today we're going to hear about a camp in Costa Rica. And there are some very interesting things in Costa Rica, but I'm, I have never been there. I've been in, in the region and I've heard a lot about it. I've met one of the former prime ministers in conferences who told me that they have no army. And they don't feel that they need an army. Even if they had an army, what could it do? <laughs> if, if giant other armies <laughs> decided to invade them, they, they, you know, they would lose. So what, what is the reason for the army? What they need is peace and and they need functional ecosystems. And I think that's what we all need. So that's what's on my mind these days. And I hope that that is useful. And I'm sure you're going to enjoy listening to the camp in Costa Rica. And I think right now, Christina is going to tell you news about the whole movement around the world. Thanks for listening. 
Thanks a lot, John. Thank you so much for sharing this message. And yeah, I agree with you. And I'm personally super excited about uh, the presentation tonight because uh, Corcovado Foundation is from Costa Rica. And I believe, as you said, Costa Rica as a nation has a lot to teach us and to teach many governments around the world. So I'm really looking forward to Alejandra's presentation. But before that, um, let's quickly share uh, the presentation with the uh, uh, the latest news from our Global ERC movement. So one second. Here we go. And then we'll leave the floor to Alejandra. So as usual, just uh, some house rules. Uh, please hold your questions until after Alejandra's presentation or post them in the chat. During the Q&A, you may ask your question in person by raising your hand, and you can also put it in the chat if you prefer. And the session is scheduled for about an hour, uh, but you can, you can stay on uh, for an open discussion later. And yes, please mute your mic until uh, the Q&A. Now, uh, talking about the opportunities to participate and learn, we have two great courses coming up. The first one is the popular Ecosystem Restoration Design course, the 2024 edition. The ERD course is a five-module course and is presented in partnership with Gaia Education. It will start on the 10th of February 2024. So the ERD course is idea for those who are new to the world of ecosystem restoration and would like to gain a general understanding of how our, how our planet's ecosystems work. Um, important, we are running a, a webinar next week on Thursday, so the 23rd, uh, where you can learn more about the course and uh, its contact directly from the teachers, but you also have the chance to ask your questions and uh, there will be uh, former students on the call, so it's a great opportunity. Also, because we're offering all webinar participants a 20% discount, which will not be repeated on the full course. So register for the webinar, and uh, my colleague Kath will be sharing uh, all the links in the chat. The second one is the Embercomb Rewilding course, which is developed in partnership with ERC Embercomb, and it's a nine-month learning journey that will equip anyone with the knowledge, skills, and also context to be able to rewire the plot of land. Um, so whether you want to learn how to rewire your garden or a farm, school grounds, a local park, just in general your full life, uh, this is the course because it covers it all. And it's also very interesting because it's part online and part of the can you please move yourself? Who oh, we're hearing? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I was saying that it's part online and part residential, and that also makes it very interesting and special. And we had some great feedbacks from uh, last year's students. It's brilliant to be part of it. It's going to be starting, as you know, we're going to be having a lot of together, but even back over the next month. Rasta? Please mute yourself. Thanks, John. So, uh, yeah, we're running the webinar on the 27th of November to tell you more about this course. And again, the link uh, will be in the chat. Then moving to some uh, volunteering opportunities uh, with uh, the ERC at our ecosystem restoration communities. We have a wonderful opportunity at Altiplano in Spain, and this opportunity is completely funded by the uh, EU Solidarity Corps program, and it's for youth aged 18 to 30. Uh, but this is not the only one. We have an opportunity for each continent and for all ages. Uh, ERC Sita Tunga Kitale in Kenya is also, is also looking for volunteers uh, to support them with their monitoring and evaluation efforts and also other tasks that are key to the success of their of their restoration initiative 
And then in Brazil, we have ERC Sinaldo Valle, who is looking for both short-term and long-term volunteers for supporting the many, many, many projects they're running. A few more opportunities. We have another one from ERC Koromi River and Aracupo Farm, again in Kenya. We presented Koromi River last month during our last fireside chat, and Aracubo Farm is also another location that is run by the same ERC leader, the same team, and uh, it's also in the same geographical area, close to the city of Malindi. So check also this volunteer opportunity. And finally, a wonderful ongoing opportunity at ERC Corcovado in Costa Rica, where the volunteers will get the chance to support their activities in ecosystem restoration, regenerative farming, and community support. And I'm pretty sure that after tonight's presentation, we will all be dreaming of traveling to Corcovado and volunteering with Alejandra and the rest of the team. And of course, head over to the ERC.earth for more details on each of these uh, rewarding opportunities. Some news now from uh, the movement. So wonderful news from ERC Mombasa Mangroves in Kenya. Uh, Mubarak and his team, they received an enormous donation from Climate Partner Impact in Germany to plant 100,000 mangrove seedlings. And this is wonderful news. Then an event from ERC King's Garden in the Netherlands uh, during winter. Uh, the Winter Broad, I'm sorry for my horrible Dutch pronunciation, Biodiversity Week that is happening from the 26th of November till the 10th of December. So this is an event for Dutch speaking earth restorers. And for more details, my colleague, chat, my colleague Kath will again share the link in the chat. And also, we're looking for someone, uh, for a great volunteer, uh, who is willing to contribute their basic admin and coordination skills to work with the global ERC movement and the ERC team. So, uh, well, this is an interesting opportunity because it will allow the volunteer to be in direct touch with some of the ERCs and to directly contribute to help them plant as many trees as possible. So it is a remote position, but it still has a direct impact on the ground. And it's a voluntary part-time role that can be done from anywhere in the world. So yeah, uh, send us your applications. The time investment is about five hours per week for about uh, three months. And again, you will find the link in the chat. And let's now travel to Bolivia. We are still raising funds uh, with uh, our partner organization, Global Giving, to help uh, almost 300 families at ERC Chokaya. The fundraisers will close next Thursday on the 23rd of November, so these are the last days to donate. And it's a wonderful, wonderful project because the funds uh, will help building six new concrete water reservoirs and six water infiltration lakes and channels, all in the um, Potosi Highlands in the Bolivian Andes. So each reservoir can harvest about 30,000 liters to irrigate 200 agroforestry, agroforestry plots in the dry season and provide drinking water at schools. So it's a wonderful project. And with your help, we can restore the ecosystem and natural function of the land and enable sustainable long-term solution for this vulnerable community. Link in the chat again, check it out. And finally, we really need your help to grow. So please tell your friends, tell them all about our mighty movement and tell them to tell their friends and also tell them to donate to support our work. And remember, you can always stay connected with us and catch all of the updates of the ERC movement by following us on social media platforms and especially Instagram and LinkedIn. So that's all from our side. And I'm really, really happy to leave the floor to Alejandra. Hi, everybody. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here and definitely I'm very honored to be part of this community of doers. And as uh, John was talking about like 
how we like people's protesting but n may maybe not doing what they need to do i feel that there's uh you know, people are looking for large solutions, but the truth is that the small solutions are the ones that are going to make a difference. And we're doing those small solutions on the ground. And I'm very, very honored to be part of this community of doers that are actually making an impact in their communities. Um, Costa Rica is definitely an area that is... Um, Costa Rica is definitely an area that um, still not going through like um, tough dis the certification, but we are seeing the impact of um, bad management of soil, bad man management of erosion, and uh, the work that uh, we're do doing is definitely making making a difference. And it's important that we we um, um, keep learning from these processes and that we understand that there are places places in the world that were not natural deserts and became um decertified because of our um uh, mismanagement um and i'm really happy to be here with you guys uh i'm gonna share uh my presentation did I say my name? My name is Alejandra Monge, and I'm the executive director of the Kurkova Foundation. And let's see. Don't forget the um, audio and yeah. button. Yeah. I got it. Thank you so much. Like I never knew that before. So can you see my presentation? Wait. You, I'm not you could also make it full. Yeah. Now we see it well. Okay. Okay. So, as I said, my name is Alejandra Monge. I'm the executive director of the Corcova Foundation, and I've been working with the foundation for like 23 years now. Pretty much have my life, and the foundation is like my biggest passion and uh, my youngest son. Um, here, here's Costa Rica. Um, we're located in the southern side of Costa Rica. So this area over here is called the Osa Peninsula. And the Osa Peninsula in general, including uh, some parts of the um, uh, mountain range up here are considered some of the most uh, biologically intense places in the world. And Costa Rica is a really, really small place. So while the country has only 0.03% of the world land mass, it contains 5% of the world biodiversity. And the reason of that is because um, we are a bridge between South America and North America. So mammals um, and birds and all kinds of species moved uh, between South America and, and North America through Central America and they, many of them remained. Um, of course, now biological corridors have been um, damaged so much that that is not a possibility, but um, historically our country has um, a huge amount of biodiversity. So every square meter in Costa Rica has more biodiversity than many places in the world. And around 25% of the country in the areas is uh, protected under national park systems or some kind of protected areas. Um, and is the largest protected areas uh, is the, the the largest percentage of protected areas in the world, thirteen percent, um, where in average everybody protects around eight percent. And because of this, Costa Rica is considered one of the most mega diverse country in the world, meaning we have more species per square meter than many countries in the world. For example. Brazil and Colombia probably have m many more mammals in general, but because we're so small and we have so many mammals in in so little space, um, we're considered mega diverse. So every time there's the destruction of rainforest in Costa Rica, there's a little huge loss of biodiversity. And as John said, Costa Rica doesn't have an army since 1948 and uh, we knock on wood we haven't needed it ever 
um, and it was a great decision and a strong decision by um, by a politician, which shows that sometimes political decisions can really change the course of a country. And in our case, we invested all the money that we were spending on an army that, as John said, was not going to defend us anyway into um, becoming um, a more educated country, bringing public education to many, many people all over the all over the, the, the place, and also providing um, better social care for lots of people. It's not perfect. Is you know we're still a very small country with a very small budget, but we do what we can, and at least we're not wasting it on uh, weapons. And going to the Kurkova Foundation, well, our vision is to create thriving communities, living in harmony with nature. We know we're a part of nature. Humans, we're part of nature. We can't think about a world where, like, humans do not exist. I mean, thinking about uh, recovering every single uh, square meter of land in the world might not be possible, but we might be able to live in harmony with nature and see each other as part of um this web uh of um life that is um fundamental not only for the, for the other species in the world but for us um the foundation is a nonprofit organization uh that has been leading conservation in costa rica uh we work with people to protect our natural resources. So for us, is involving communities is really, really important in this whole process. And our conservation programs are mostly based in the South and Pacific of Costa Rica, where I show you. Um, and, and basically, the reason why we did that is because the Osa Peninsula is uh, so fragile and so intense in biodiversity and holds 50% of the biodiversity of the whole country. So for us, like keeping it uh, pristine was, is one of our priorities. And this is, uh, this is gonna give you a little, a little bit of an idea of like where we are and um, where we are and um, where we work.
sorry. Mm. Nope. <laughs> Hold on. I see the video was quite effective. There's already I people see. who are asking, do you say you want volunteers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is the uh, the beautiful side of it, right? But the where we work in is the areas that are degraded, right? So this area is so beautiful and because it's so beautiful, there's so many like international inv investors, like you know, big companies that want to buy land and and put a hotel in the middle of nowhere and say, hey, come to our eco development and buy all the people out and and develop everything. So for us, it's really important to work with the community to be able to help them generate um, productive uh, activities that can restore the ecosystem, but also um, help them have a, 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 a dignified living, right? So we've been um, focusing on regenerative agriculture and community-based tourism. That's why you saw all those tours which like all these people, all the stores that you saw over there are tours that are in the hands of local people, farmers, um, that because of, because there's hoping that there's going to be tourism coming, they want to protect their land. But if tourism doesn't come, eventually they might sell. So uh, we're really trying to promote all this like local tours in the hands of local people, community-based tours. Um, that are actually going to be that can give people like the opportunity of staying in their land instead of like selling it to big investors that are going to destroy it. And the other thing we've been working, we've been working for 20 years in environmental edu education. We've been working in ecosystem restoration in the last three years and holistic cattle farming, which uh, cattle farming in the area is very strong and it has caused a huge impact on um, um, fragmenting the ecosystems. And we've been trying to reach out to cattle farmers so that they can have a positive impact instead of a negative impact. Um, so we've been promoting the nature solutions for community development. And to do that, We've been working with community members, with local authorities, with local businesses to promote restoration and training for sustainable tourism, regenerative agriculture, and holistic livestock management. And and when I refer to productive restoration, I know I'm sure you guys all know, but yeah, I'm just going to say just in case, uh, is the restoration of some some of the elements of the structure and the function of the regional ecosystem together with the productivity of the land. So the idea is that uh, the communities can still produce and they can have uh, farms that are actually welcoming biodiversity, welcoming um, uh, in, uh, enriching soils and that kind of things and benefiting their communities. And just, we're just seeing quick, also- Alejandra, ahead, but, sorry for interrupting, just a quick question. Are you still moving through your slides? Because I just oh I yes, I am. Them. You you can't see it. Them. No. Okay. Oh. To, to share your screen again. Oh sure. Okay. Let me see what what happened. Um. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> I'm like talking there, like. Can you see that? Yes. Uh, yes. Perhaps if you go exactly presenter mode, perfect. Yeah. So, um, so as I said, like we work, in, we're working with all levels of the community, from leaders to government uh, to local people, just to like be able to learn, share uh, knowledge of like the 
different ways that we can do to nurture land to be more harmonious with the environment. And I just said that. Um, so basically, as part of our productive restoration, we're talking about agroforestry and um, agroecological tools, like um, uh, eliminating all like ag agrochemicals and that kind of things. So the first thing that we started doing was regenerative agriculture. And we started doing that because of the pandemic. We realized that the community were was like com completely isolated. Uh, they were um, dependent on on tourism. And when when Costa Rica closed the borders, they literally had no income whatsoever and no sources for food. So some of them started planting, some of them started fishing, some of them started hunting, which is legal in Costa Rica. Um, so we started uh, promoting regenerative agriculture um, and and we thought about regenerative agriculture because it is a type of agriculture that focuses on restoring the richness of the soil by restoring the ecosystem under um, under the soil, fungi, bacteria, and microfauna that lives um, that live in the soil, uh, and they're essential um, to enriching it and to make it more porous and to make it uh, better at absorbing water and that kind of things. Um, and so we've been promoting that, uh, since 2020 and, um, we have trained about 50 families to implement, uh, different projects in their farms. Some of them in their, in the backyards of their houses, some of them in the schoolyards, some of them in their farms. And right now about 83 hectares of land are producing food without using agrochemicals and respecting nature balance, promoting like biodiversity, promoting like um, the, the existence of uh, several different plants in the same place instead of just thinking about monoculture. Um, we, we realized that promoting tourism as the only source of income because for the longest time we were promoting uh, community-based tourism uh, made the community very vulnerable to crisis like the COVID and, and, that, and now the climate crisis. And uh, one thing that is very important here is that just like nature, we need to be diverse. Um, uh, diversity is nature's solution to uh, sickness, you know, where there's many different plants uh, you don't have the same attacks of insects and that kind of stuff. It's the same thing when you have an economic activity. If you don't rely on one single economic activity, then you still can you can, you can still be you can still stand up when like a crisis affects that particular activity. And it's hilarious because I see it I see it in my yard. Um, sometimes there's this bug that just like literally love these plants but leaves everything else alone so i know that if i have several different plants in my garden uh that's my 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 um my insurance right something is going to survive because the whatever is eating it is going to eat what the whatever they prefer and not everything else but if you have only one plant planted for miles then you're going to have that insect just eat everything you have and the thing with re regenerative agriculture is that it helps local families produce their own food without needing to buy um, uh, agrochemicals it reduces the use of of agrochemicals in general it alleviates the economic situations of local families um, it reduces the pressure on natural resources because uh, what we were seeing here in our communities was that people would be uh, like their land, their soil would like die because they were like burning it or cutting it down. And so all the good soil was being gone. And because we taught them a way to enrich their soil, they don't need to expand. They don't need to keep cutting. They don't need to keep burning. So it was, um, it was really, really, um, wonderful how like we could help them become more efficient to be able to protect the rest of the land that they have. And then um, 
regenerative agriculture also has the amazing capacity of fixating uh, carbon dioxide in the soil and uh, providing um, a viable ecosystem for uh, many micro species to survive. Um, so basically, for communities, it's a great way to to adapt to climate change. So for us, it was really important to promote it. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's about promoting multiple crops um, to to promote biodiversity. It's about redu uh, redu uh, reducing erosion and use uh, compost for fertilizers. So basically, uh, when we were in this huge crisis and everybody was talking about um, how they needed fertilizers from Ukraine. Um, we were like, well, we can produce our own fertilizers from our own farms. You don't even have to go out of your farm to produce to uh, fertilizers to enrich your soil. And one of the examples that we had was we were working with microorganisms um, that we would collect from the rainforest, and we would like we call them a trap is basically you put like some rice like cooked rice on the on the um untouched forest and the colonies of um of uh, bacteria and everything get into the rice and then you put them in a in a place where you feed them and then you use that as a fertilizer and it's amazing and we had stories of people saying i had this tree for 20 years and never produced anything or my my uh, my lettuce was never this big, or my plants were never this big. I ha we had people saying, "I I did the test, like I put fertilizer on one, like the natural fertilizer on one, and then I put the uh, synthetic fertilizer on the other one, and look at the difference. Like like the natural fertilizer was double as the size, didn't cost them anything, and basically was made with their own resources." Um, so it is, it, it is, this is a great opportunity to reduce the impact of agriculture in the environment, um, and to keep communities engaged and living in good conditions and having a good health. Um, and then we have, um, uh, um, ecological restoration. We've had a lot of, uh, activities, uh, working with people from, from local people and po people from all over the world uh, helping the foundation to plant trees. Just in 2020, 20, no, no, that's, uh, that, that's not right. Um, up to 2020, at, up to this point, to, to this date, uh, our tree has planted about 4,000 trees. In 2022, we have planted like 2,300. Uh, and these trees are grown to a point that they're big enough to survive and they're they, you know, um, but we we're going to still care for them for the next three, three more years. Um, and we have volunteers, as I said, from all over the world. Hello, my name's Taylor and this is Felipe. Hold on, let me see. And we are planting trees today with the Colca Valdo Foundation and we are super excited. We are going to do 300 trees. Can you imagine that? Oh my God, 300 trees. <laughs> Did you guys, could you guys see that? You hear it? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, 
So um, in the last uh, project that we had, uh, we were working on um, replanting around 3,824 3, trees between 21 and 23. We had six uh, reforestation campaigns that included around 70 different types of, um, of um, trees because we need to maintain everything very um, biodiverse as Costa Rica is. But we start always with like the fast growing trees, like the one you can see in the first in the first picture, um, are trees that actually have the capacity to survive on very poor soils that have been maybe cattle farms or eroded by another reason or for like uh, clear cutting. And, and we plant those and then we plant the ones that are a little bit more um, sensitive to like to like poor soils or like too much sun or that kind of things. Um, we've had in the last two years, we had 58 volunteers that particip participated in, in restorations and we had uh, six camera traps installed for wildlife uh, monitoring. And so that's some of the things that our volunteers do. They um, help us um, uh, check on the cameras and kind of like um, be able to detect if there's like an improvement or an increase in, in, in wildlife uh, activity. And this is the area that we were re referencing. This is a picture from Restore. And I apologize because this one is kind of blurred. I took it from there too, but you can see that what everything that was completely uh, deforested now is growing back. And of course, not all the trees are the same size, uh, so it doesn't look as green, as strong green as it, um, it looks, for example, where like it hasn't been touched, but it looks um, much better. And here in this area over here, this is an area that what we did was we limit, limited the limitations uh, we um, reduced the, the, we eliminated all the cattle that was like getting in there and uh, we are letting it, um, because it's so close to the rainforest, we believe that the transit between um, um, mammals and birds and this kind of things is going to produce like a natural restoration. So... As you can see, like this area is all um, now restored and it's looking green and beautiful. Um, and we're super happy about it. And this is one of the findings that we had, like a uh, tapir or danta, that is uh, one of the biggest mammals in America, um, passing by happily, um, which had not been seen in a while. So that's how you can tell that um, uh, restoration helps. And um, our next project is this Finca San Juan. And as you can see, it's completely deforested. This is how the other four, uh, land looked before, like no um, one or two um, trees here or there and lots of erosion, as you can see here, poor soils. Uh, all these lines you hear, see here is the effect of erosion um, on on empty is um, empty lands, and this is the land that we're going to be refreshed in. And basically, our goal is to refresh uh, 17 hectares. Uh, basically, we're going to have a density of around uh, 750 trees per hectares, and around seven different uh, 70 different species. And I know when everybody got there, they were like, oh, this looks really bad. <laughs> um, so we're working on that. And and what the, what our volunteers are going to be doing is they're going to be planting trees. They're going to be building fences to keep the cattle out. They're going to be tagging trees and monitoring development. So how much are they growing? Are they surviving? Which ones are doing better? Uh, they're going to be uh, checking on camera traps, uh, providing advice. Sometimes we get volunteers that are very knowledgeable about different processes. And sometimes where we fail, somebody comes and says, hey, how about you try this? And then we do, and it works wonderfully. So, you know, we love advice from people from other places and other countries with different experiences that might be useful for us. 
and they also help us care for newly planted trees and nurseries. And then we have our holistic cattle farming, which is kind of new, but it's been amazing because the awesome thing about it is that um, the area has a lot of cattle farming that has been degrading the land and that has been, yeah, fragmenting uh, corridors and ecosystems. And we got 10 um, cattle farmers that when we show them like how they could do things better, how they could like have an impact and protect their ecosystem and restore their water sources, they were all for it. And they were so motivated. And we took them to see a successful project in the Caribbean side of Costa Rica. And these guys came back saying, we're all in. And I don't know if you can see, but um, what Carlos here is, ho is holding is a map of his property. And he has property that is like some corridors in here, um, some areas where, where, where he lived, right? And what he wants to do is he wants to restore all these areas for um, rape, for um, secondary forest. And he wants to create uh, live fences. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's like numbers on each of these things. And these things here are little um, parcels where like the, the, um, the cattle feeds. And the idea is that all these like areas are going to have uh, live fences planted by trees that they're going to receive water in the different areas so that the cattle doesn't have to go to the to the river and by doing that they can also restore the river banks so it's a, it's a wonderful project that not also um, improve the efficiency of the of uh, producing cattle but it also um, it helps restore ecosystems in corridors, fix carbon, and increase the income for the farmers. And here what they're doing is they're measuring the capacity of the field to produce, and then they can separate the fields in uh, sizes that the farmers can guarantee that if they put all their cattle in the same place, uh, it can, um, it's going to be able to survive. And this is something uh, based from like um, 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 map feeding or it's based uh, on like what um, Alan Savory from the Savory Institute um, kind of like detected that was based on like the natural um, the natural uh, activity of rumians in Africa when they were predators. When predators were gone, then the, the rumians had a different um, um, activity. But what, if you put them like in in small spaces, they will have like the same impact. And as you can see, for example, here, uh, Carlos is saying, okay, so this area over here can be all restored around the, around the river. Uh, this is a this is secondary forest that I will keep. This is an area that I can restore, uh, and this is areas that I'm going to use for cattle because I'm going to be more efficient and I'm going to have a bigger impact. Um, together, this cattle farmer, this uh, cattle farmers own like about around 500 hectares, and the expectations that they will be able to map their lands and establish dedicated areas for cattle reforestation, life fences, and forest preservation. We believe that because this is going to be so successful, we're like totally sure that this is going to be so successful um, that other people is going to join. And although, you know, many people is against eating meat, I'm not a big meat eater, uh, but there's people that survive out of this. And uh, this is a way to help them do it in a smarter way and in a more eco-friendly way and to actually uh, is not, you know, mitigate their carbon uh, produ production. And what volunteers do with and that is that they help farmers rewild, 
riverbanks, planting living fences, and restore idle lands that are not going to be used because they are good. At, they are able to to keep their their cattle in less space. And these are some of the groups that we've had. And then, as I mentioned, we've had a long-standing uh, environmental education program. Uh, kids are learning about how to plant, to um, produce uh, trees, how to produce their own food, and this you know it's it's, uh, it's wonderful. People are so excited, and what vo what volunteers are doing there is they're they're teaching kids their experience. Uh, they're talking about their countries, and so with that, helping them expand their experience, their their horizons, and thinking about like how the world might be different than from their little area. And um, they're helping environmental educators with the activities and also their learning because it's also like a really great learning opportunity and also a really great learning opportunity of a new language, right? And since 2003, we've had, we work with like more than 3,500 children um, and uh, just this year, we had 146 educational activities, which are the only extracurricular activities that these kids have uh, in their communities. Uh, also, besides that, we also work with them uh, Saturdays and other days to help them um, catch up with, in school so that they can finish school, make sure that they can like um, keep learning and finish their, their high school. Uh, because we know that the more resources you have, the better you are with the environment. And these are some pictures. Uh, this is our little researcher. And here are kids um, freeing uh, sea turtles, sea turtle babies. So they're like seeing uh, how they're freeing the sea turtles. And um, all these activities are based from our uh, bio hostel, which I think you saw some some shots over there on the video. Um, and it's a very, you know, it's a very comfortable place. People eat really well. We have a bunch of local tours that are only available, uh, through us because nobody else sells them. I mean, if, if it's not for us, like these people won't make a, a, a dollar on tourism, which sucks because like, as I said, like if they don't get benefits from tourism, they will sell their properties to like big companies and become, you know, and become like big uh, hotel uh, developments. And just to you, just to finish, I want to invite you, like we're going to have a, okay, so we have long-term opportunities for people that want to um, uh, participate with the foundation, like for, you know, two or three months. And um, you guys can email me about it. Uh, we're also going to have a restoration camp that's going to be super fun uh, from June 13th to the 27th. And it includes uh, transportation from from the airport in San Jose to the, to the area, which is far, <laughs> and room and board and all the activities, except like optional activities, because like uh, some of the activities we have is like we have, um, well, we have like, some workshops about how to make bio inputs and vermicompost and that kind of thing. Uh, some activities as like tree planting, uh, some field lunches, uh, beach cleanups. Um, and then we have, do we have this, we have Kukuala National Park, which is considered one of the best national parks in the world. Uh, it's very close to us. So you can, uh, for an additional $110, you can do that. That that um, that natural park. You can go dive in also, which is also one of the traditional tours in the area. You can dive in uh, Caño Island, which is probably the best dive in in continental Costa Rica. The best dive in in the country is Cocos Island, but that's a lot. That's like ten thousand dollars to get there. Uh, but you can do um, Caño Island, which is beautiful diving, amazing, lots of sharks, lots of um, eels. Um, We'll do um, seed collections and learning how to like um, uh, making uh, seedlings and, and plants out of that. 
Um, you can participate in educational activities. You can do farm work. Um, you can do gardening, reforestation, and work on the national park too with demarcation and and train train uh, improvement trail improvements. And the last day we'll have a beach barbecue, so it's going to be really fun. So that's uh, a little bit of what we do. We try to make it something that is restoring uh, the environment, also uh, making tourism becoming a restor uh, restoration tool and um, making communities participate in the whole process because as John well said, we can't do this all alone. Everybody has to pitch in and everybody has to be motivated to, to help. And so if you want to join us, like just email me and that's my presentation. Did I take more time than I was supposed to? Wow. <laughs> what a wonderful place. I guess, yeah, I think we, we took a bit longer, but I, I, I enjoyed it so much. It's, uh, it's such a beautiful, beautiful natural area. And your work, uh, the work that you're doing at Corcovado, Alejandra, is really uh, also uh, so holistic, like the approaches. You're working on so many different uh, uh, sides from ecotourism to education, to working with the communities with uh, uh, holistic uh, grazing and, and regenerative farming. So, I mean, yeah, I guess the presentation was much more to cover all of that. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank and you. Now, perhaps there's already a few questions. As we said, feel free to raise your hands and ask your question in person or just put it in the chat, whatever uh, you're more comfortable with. I actually have a very quick question. I was wondering, since you're now working on so many di different uh, uh, programs, let's call them, uh, what, what was it that pushed you to start the project? Because I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but Corcovado is at least 20 years old, if not, more than that. So, what? what yeah, well, we started working because um, the uh, we're neighbors. Like basically, we're neighbors with Corcovado National Park and uh, Forestry Reserve. And the government was given permits uh, to cut the Forestry Reserve, and we were seeing like gigantic trees, like being like taking out, you know, every day. Um, and we were like, this doesn't look good. This doesn't look good. Um, so the founders of the foundation at that time, they they uh, uh, hire a lawyer and they hire a forestry engineer and they said, can you revise all those permits? Because it doesn't make sense that they're like cutting all these trees like that. Um, and what happened was, they found that many of the permits given were illegal, uh, were not well studied by the government. And um, so we were able to cut down permits from 68 to 8. So it was, uh, it was huge. So we started doing that and we started hiring park rangers with funding that we would like try to like fundraise. Um, so that people couldn't cut the forest. And then at some point we're like, you know, this, if people don't understand why, why we're trying to stop them to cut the forest, if they don't see that this is their heritage, that one day is going to generate them income, or also the fact that it's pro that th this ecosystem is providing them water and protecting them from flooding and, you know, all these things, people, are not going to protect it. So we can put a uh, uh, park ranger in every corner and we're not going to be able to stop him. So we started doing that 20 years ago with environmental education. But then we realized that when there's poverty, when communities are forgotten by the, by the government and they don't have the minimum conditions to survive, you can tell them as much as you want, but they have to eat, right? So 
that's when we were like, we turn into like, let's find ways for communities to generate income and also survive by protecting the forest. Right. So that would, that, that's like, that's been the transition. Right. And we focused a lot on, uh, community based tourism. And then we realized that, uh, it was not enough. And when the COVID hit and tourism, cause it was, was dead, like that everybody, everybody that had been doing well with tourism were like literally like figured out how to survive. So they were changing oranges for tomatoes or eggs or fishing or, you know, so that's, that's how we, we've been learning a lot, right? On 20 years. So like, it's not, we just didn't, we have been evolving, I guess. What a journey. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the, the questions in the chat. So Bart asked, did the cattle farmer sell his land? Uh, sorry, my, my question is more on uh, holistic grazing. So in Africa it works because it's on uh, very large uh, thousand and thousand and hectares where the predators are, are gone or less. But you have 10 farmers uh, uh, co commonly owning 500 hectares. Um, so I, I guess it will only work if they have less uh, cattle to share. And maybe they think this will be less income because cattle gives lots of income. So was this difficult to, to convince them to have less cattle and, and go to more permaculture ideas? That's... that's so basically what we're doing is no actually there uh the projections is actually that they can have more cattle so basically so when you have extensive cattle farming you have a few cattle like roaming around and damaging the soil all over the place when you have mob Cattling, like basically, like all the all the cattle is in the same the cattle is in the same place. All the cows are basically in um, a smallest space. It's not it's not a stable. It's an open space. They have water, and and when you do, and I'm gonna like go back to a slide I had here because that's that slide is key. Um. So, for example, when you see this slide. Sure. Da -da -da. Okay. So if you see this, no. wait. Okay. Um, No, I don't know why I can't pass it to... Okay, there you go. Let me see. Can you see this bigger? Yes. Can you see that map now? Okay. So, because we don't have predators, what cattle farmers do right now, or, or, or the holistic proposal is, is that, for example... See that this this will have numbers. So I don't see number one. Here's I think here's number one, number two. So basically, like the ten, um, the ten. Let's say Carlos has fifteen, fifteen cows. He will have his fifteen cows in this space. This is the plan. The the planning he has. He will have fifteen cows in this place on on um number one, and then. Two, three days later, he will move it to number two. Number two uh, probably has been restoring uh, grass and absorbing uh, carbon and doing um, and 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 um, growing in the last for the last um, say three months or four months. That 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 means that this grass is really big and really rich and um growing fast in the meantime number one 
because they were in the same little cluster. You know, they were eating, but they were also peeing and pooping and enriching the soil and bringing microorganisms over there. So by the time they go back to one, which is going to be three months later uh, or six months later, number one is going to be super rich. So you can have the same amount of cattle or more in less space and is amazing. And it like, we've seen it, we've seen it in the Caribbean working amazingly. Of course, like how rich and how much your grass grows obviously depends a lot on um, humidity because it's a very humid country. So we'll have a lot of uh, fast growing grass, but it also works in there's um, all these success stories in New Mexico, in Arizona, in areas that have been completely degraded and where they're trying to do this and just the, the effect of the cattle being together in one place helps restore the soil, like enriches the soil, provides humidity and stops the, the certification. So one of the biggest impact of this process is that it stops the certification. And what's going to happen to the cattle is going to have to place water sources like in the, all these li different places here. Uh, it's going to mean that the cows are going to have to walk less to their water but also it's going to mean that it's less erosion. And it also means that the water sources can be restored. Did that answer your question? Yes, uh, I, you're doing a great job. And uh, it's uh, nice to see it works on a smaller scale as well. Thank you. That's yeah. great. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Christine, I'm, you're I'm muted. Yeah. <laughs> so I was saying the next question is from Bruno, and he is asking, can you measure carbon sequestration as the restoration expands? The restoration uh, uh, work and results are remarkable, cattle management as well. Is there a way to get involved? Wait, I, I didn't get the whole question. Uh, so can you measure uh, carbon span expansion? Is that carbon the sequestration question? as the restoration expands. And perhaps yeah. Bruno wants to explain his questions. He well, if he wants. we we we're like we're put in our place. Yeah, but Bruno, go go ahead. But just just you know, like we are using a couple of um, uh, tools. There's Restore Echo, which is um, a site that um, you like send your um, location. They take a picture of the place when you first started. And then they keep taking pictures of the place as it grows. And that shows like the growth of um, plants. And I think that is a great tool. I think everybody should try to go in there and use that because it gives you the possibility of showing um, after and be before and after, right? And then he was also adding, are there measurement of net carbon flux on various project lands and coastal areas? Um, well, yeah, um, definitely, for example, in areas where, and, and it's hard, and I got to tell you, like, I've done a lot of research and and I've talked to many people that is involved in uh, restriction processes and the numbers are always very variable, right? I mean some trees grow so fast that they like fix carbon so fast. Uh, but some, some of them are have so much density that their growth is a lot smaller, but the density of the carbon that they're fixating is bigger, right? But it takes longer. Uh, there's also the carbon on the soil. We have a project that I didn't mention here because we don't bring volunteers for that, is um, a mangrove project and mangrove uh, holds so much um, carbon on the soil, as much carbon in the soil that on the on the on the top. So um, there's many variables there that have to be um, measured. But yes, I mean there's some tools 
they're not all exact. Uh, with the uh, mango, for example, we have the help of a university that comes here and, you know, takes a, uh, basically like a tube in, collects all the uh, soil, takes it, burns the, all the um, organic matter and measures the carbon, right? But it's, it depends on your resources. And for example, with like the restriction, um, the restoration areas that we have, we don't have that kind of resources. We've been working with um, ecosystem restoration. There's a, there's a couple of uh, companies that actually help you measure the carbon that you're restoring in the, in the, um, in the land. In our case, like those, like some, like when we're restoring land in public lands, it's not interesting for, um, it's interesting only for conservation e efforts, right? Um, we know that because we're restoring and because we're using a big biodiverse, um, amount of plants and trees, we know that we are bringing back an ecosystem that was lost and that we're producing a corridor that was gone and that we are removing uh, an area that was fragmented and now that there's going to be more um, uh, movement of animals. And we've seen it. We've seen the growth of uh, fauna in the area um, just because of that. So we can't measure as much the carbon, but more like the ecosystem functions that are being restored. I hope I answered question, your question, Bruno. Yep, yeah, he's answering okay, thanks in the chat. Um, there was a question also from Bob. Uh, Bob from Korami River, the UC that was here last month for the Fireside Chat. So he's asking why only 500 trees in two weeks, or is it per volunteer? Well, it's, it's, it has to do a lot with um, getting the volunteers. So, you know, if we don't have the, the volunteers to help us, it's really hard to do it. It has to do with budget. Uh, it has to do with weather. Sometimes, for example, we had planned um, a restoration for a week and a half ago, and the, the we had so much rain that the, the the volunteers couldn't cross the river, so we had to cancel it. So it's this is an area that is basically you're crossing you're crossing rivers with your car and you're. Um, you know, sometimes you don't have electricity and no way to con communicate with anybody and, you know, cell phones are gone and you're like, how do I keep calling all these people if like, I can't, you know, I can't communicate. So yeah, this is like the, this is like the Amazonas of Costa Rica, right? It's like the end of the, the last frontier. So Yeah, that makes sense. And hopefully tonight we helped you find a few more volunteers <laughs> with <the> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful videos that you showed us. Yeah, I gotta say volunteers are so crucial for us. I mean, not only they help us, uh, but like included into that things, a little bit of like the materials that we need and it's hard. I mean, I know that here, most people here are probably nonprofits or uh, individual volunteer, uh, people working on their own to try to make an impact. Um, so I know you guys all know how hard it is to maintain these efforts. Uh, we all do it because we love it. One of, like, somebody was telling me, like, really? Like, you're asking me for money again? This is harassment. And I'm like, well, that's my job. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're doing the job. We're, we're planting trees for you, dude. It's like, if we don't do this, I mean, your like lifestyle is going to go to somewhere else. And, 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 um, and yeah, I know it's not easy, but yeah, we need, we need funding and we need, 
uh, hands and we need support and, you know, it's hard. And I'm sure everybody here kind of like relates to it because, you know, we're all in the same boat, right? Doing, doing a fight that um, maybe is not easy, but it's, the, it's what we love, right? We want to leave this place a better place. Yes, yes, completely agree. Uh, love your attitude as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is the work that matters. And yeah, especially people who are doing it on the ground are real heroes facing all these difficulties and still going strong because it's so important, honestly, it is. Um, I wonder if there are more questions, otherwise it's... Well, it's 7.30 in Europe. I'm not sure what, what's the time in Costa Rica. But we've been here for one hour and a half with Eddie. Um, so, I mean, I'm also mindful that you have many things to do, Alejandra, and also the other people here. So, if there are no other questions, perhaps we can wrap it up. And if there's someone who wants to stay longer, to just chat and have a conversation. I think Kath will leave uh, the link open if that's possible and the, the, the call can still continue. Oh, there's a few more questions. Bruno is still asking, have you considered revenue from carbon sequestration? Yeah, we, we can't do it because of the property, but we, we want to hit, generate revenue for like the farmers that are doing it. We're want to do it for the cattle farmers that are like trying to say, okay, so since I'm planning better, I, this land is going to be idle. Like it's the, I should never have had like cattle there because it was like very eroded and, you know, poor soils and stuff like that. I should just let that grow. So what we want to do is we want to be able to create um, a carbon revenue for people that actually are actually saying, I'm going to put apart all this land to protect it so that, um, so that it can be a good area of, so, so, so that it's not going to fall on me to start with because like rainforest protects from like, um, um, what we call, um, landslides, um, so that it's going to stop erosion and, you know, it, it provides a bunch of services for them, but, um, definitely having an income from doing something good for the humanity. Uh, would be great for them too because we're talking about very poor people that are like you know scrambling to make it make make uh ends meet right so it's it would be great if we can like uh cre create a system where we can like make sure that these guys get paid for the prop the areas of the property that can be restored and I put my email over there. If anybody has a question or if I can help anybody with anything, I'll be super happy to um, answer them on my email. Wonderful. And I think John has something to say. Well, yeah, I'd just like to say that um, in terms of the economics, we have to really consider what is carbon trading about how much money are are people who are sequestering carbon getting and how much does it and how long has this been going on so i've been observing it since 1997 and i don't think that the program of carbon um, offsets has been very effective and especially now there are some exposés of, of programs to offset carbon pollution or car carbon excessive emissions of greenhouse gases by corporations, which have turned out to not actually do anything but re reinvest money into the people who cause a problem. So, what is it seems to me very important is to have a holistic understanding of what's happening to the climate. And this is everyone. 
So if everyone understands this, then it's impossible to be moved by some sort of impressionistic meme about like, well, this is how we have to, to restore the earth, or this is how we have to deal with climate change. We need to understand that it's, there's systemic dysfunction in terrestrial ecosystems and also now in ocean systems. And so this is not something which is small. It's something which is really quite large. And it's very complex. And so we don't want to really get hung up on the complexity either, but we, we do want to arrive at collective intelligence and collective understanding of, of where we are in, in human history at this time. Other civilizations have destroyed their ecosystem. But then maybe that civilization would fail. But another civilization could come up somewhere else in the world. But now we're actually facing this on a planetary scale. So it looks like the danger to hu human civilization and humans, humans as a species is much larger than it was in the past because it was only threatening the civilization that was damaging its, its landscape. And now, actually, some of the people who are most affected have very little to do with the causes of, of the degradation. So there is somehow karma connected to this as well. And also these people who are being heavily affected may have very little in the way of resources and they may have even lost their human rights because some of the things that we're seeing were caused by colonization or slavery or genocide in, in places. So we really need to come to grips with what's happening now, some people in the past caused some really serious disruptions, and some people really benefited enormously. And to desperation and into poverty and, and, and when we look at what is happening with ecological restoration, we have to realize, well, that's nice. the rights of all the people and who have been damaged and, and hurt in the past and who actually have the store of the earth. And to do that, we have to change the economy and the polluters and just giving a few, a little bit to the people who have been massively affected for them to, to, it's not enough, it's not okay. We have to realize that the, the value of functional thing that human beings have ever made, beings will ever make. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, we can pay because the economy will then be based on something which is real, based on extraction and manufacturing and buying and selling, and worse, an interest-bearing debt. So the reality is the global economy is more based on speculation not actually a thing <laughs> to, to enrich the people who control and not something which benefits everyone. 
And so if we don't really fully understand this, we better have this conversation. And we better do everything we can to restore the soils, the water, the vegetation, and the biodiversity. But in the process of doing this, we should give back the human rights to the, all the Turn the habitat for have to consider money as material things, and we certainly don't have to consider or interest bearing debt. So, you know, when we also look at the fact that you can make new currencies. <laughs> currencies that are serving grow their communities. And when we look at the, we think of money I was recently in instantly because I, I, I paid for my visa with a hundred dollar bill and I got a million two hundred and fifty thousand rupee back. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what has happened since the last time I that there is this kind of hyperinflation and they have to print new bills with like six figure bills. What is wealth? What is abundance? When we look at a, a flowing river, when we look at the beautiful landscapes in Costa Rica, that's much more valuable than the money that's coming over and the people who have that money from the developed world are thinking that they're richer than the people in Costa Rica. Well, that's not really true. They just have a currency that has been part of a dominant political economic reality that comes from domination of, of people. We should be careful about these kinds of things and be honest about these kinds of things. And we need to be forgiving and grateful and compassionate about what's happening because I mean, really nobody who's alive today started this mess, <laughs> but we're all in this together. So we could all solve it by doing what's right for everyone instead of saying, well, that happened in the past, so we just have to accept it and leave the people who are miserable to be miserable and those who have who have who have uh, benefited just l let them carry on that's okay john sorry to interrupt yeah i just wanted to thank alejandra for being here with us and for her presentation thanks a Excellent. lot it's wonderful and yeah uh, i think we all enjoyed it and and you're now the host so please feel free to stay on the call and continue the conversation with John. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. Well, anybody who wants to stay, and, and if Alejandro is not in a hurry, you know, you could ask her anything, I think, about her, her or maybe you could volunteer to go and just sign up with her. Um, I can't stay too long, I gotta say, because, um, I actually am taking care of my mom who just had surgery, so um, I need to go feed her. <laughs> uh, but I can stay for five more minutes if anybody has a question. Well, is there anything that you would say you need the most from, from help from people from all over the world? Well, I, I think that what I what I would say that is the most important thing is that we don't feel hopeless, that we don't think that we are we have uh, uh, that we don't feel powerless, and to change our attitude towards um, making a difference. I think everybody can make a difference from their apartment, from their backyard, from you know, 
from their everyday consumption activities, as you said, like, you know, buying is not necessarily going to make, uh, make you a happier person. Um, I believe that definitely my, my biggest, um, my biggest concern is people feeling hopeless and powerless, but, um, as an organization, definitely, we definitely need support. Um, we need exposure and hopefully people hands on the ground, um, helping us plant trees and working with farmers and making a difference. And, and sometimes, you know, it doesn't have to be on the property. It could be like just helping us promote our work. And I'm sure like everybody here as restoration camps um, are also in the same need, right? Um, definitely like having the opportunity to present our project to you guys is like definitely a great uh, help. So I'm, I'm very, very thankful that you guys uh, gave us an opportunity to present our projects. Thank you again, and thanks everyone. Um, I just wanted to share my email, but it should be iCloud, and I clearly have made a mistake. <laughs> something, I have a German computer keyboard, so it's very strange, but it should be uh, iCloud.com. So if anybody wants to talk to me, um, and if I can help you in any way, Alejandro, please, please let me know. And uh, thank you. Oh yeah, somebody put it in now correctly. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, and I'm I'm I very I feel very honored to be here, John, with you and uh, with every all these wonderful people too making a difference and not sitting idle and doing nothing just like you know just making a change so um good for you all and um keep keep your good work and i as i said in the beginning i think that is all about like small solutions and little acts that get together and make a difference so very 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 proud of all of you. Very, very, very honored to be here with you all wonderful people. So that will for you guys. Thank you very much, Alexandra, and all the best for your mom. Okay. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, you guys take care. Thanks, Alejandra. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you all. Bye, everyone.